Welcome back to this video. Today we're going to talk about Threat Intelligence in Security Operations Center. Previously, we have talked a lot about Threat Intelligence and we discussed a lot of Threat Intelligence tools. But today we're going to link or to explain the link between Threat Intelligence and a Security Operations Center. So basically, let's first define Threat Intelligence. So Threat Intelligence in itself is a process. A process to analyze data okay and use the data use the collected and analyzed data to generate um, detection rules we call the detection rules detection rules or maybe to generate insights so up until now this is very generic and broad definition of threat intelligence what are, are we actually analyzing here? So we want to talk about the data that we analyze using threat intelligence. So here we're looking into what is called as the indicators of compromise. The indicators of compromise includes IP addresses, domains, URLs, hashes, and in some instances, you might see um, cryptocurrency wallet addresses. This is very common when you are analyzing a ransomware attack. When you're analyzing a ransomware attack, we want to collect all the crypto wallet addresses used in the attack and to receive payments by the attacker. So basically, these are the most well-known indicators of compromise when we conduct threat intelligence we are actually collecting and analyzing these data okay so what's the purpose the purpose is to generate detection rules and to generate insights by generating detection rules what are we doing we are preventing against existing or emerging cyber attacks that is the use of threat intelligence in cyber security now, what's the link between threat intelligence and SOC? Remember, in a security operations center, we are continuously monitoring. We are continuously monitoring the network traffic in addition to the changes in the endpoints. So once there is a change detected in one of the endpoints, or once there is an anomaly in the network traffic, we investigate further, and if there is something malicious, we raise or we declare an incident. So in a security operation center, incident response is a very important part of the process. Okay, so now we know what is threat intelligence, and we know what is SOC. What is the link here? Okay. So the link is is first it, it first starts in threat intelligence. So the question here is how do we collect these indicators of compromises? How we collect them, and where we're gonna use them? By answering these two questions, we will be able to understand the link between threat intelligence and SOC. So how do we collect indicators of compromises? How do we stumble upon attacker's IP address, attacker's domain, the URLs used in the attack, the hashes of the malwares, and the crypto wallet addresses that are or were used in the, to receive the payment? So how do we collect and analyze all of these? So this depends on the type of the organization. Okay, never, never mind. Let's not uh delve deeper into the types of organizations we're going to first generally and uh, uh, answer this question so how do we collect these information the first thing is through incident response when there is a malware infection or there is an attack on the network we declare an incident and thus we activate the process of incident response we collect the data we isolate the host and we aim to understand what happened and clean the infected machine or extract the threat from the network. 
By conducting an instant response, we will stumble upon the IP addresses, domains, URLs, hashes, and what we call the IOCs that are left by the attacker. Okay, so that's one way we collect integrity of compromise, and therefore, actually, we activate the threat intelligence or we do threat intelligence. So, if your organization doesn't involve in, in incident response, you might collect indicators of compromise through your SOC. So, now we are beginning to understand the link between threat intelligence and SOC. So, in a security operations center, we said that we actively monitor the network traffic and the endpoint for changes or abnormal or abnormalities. When we notice something weird, we activate the threat incident response if there is sufficient evidence that the uh, discovered data is malicious. So what do we discover actually? We discover IPs, domains, URLs, hashes. So basically, again, IOCs are discovered during network monitoring. So here, one of the ways to collect IOCs is through the network monitoring conducted in a security operation center. Now, the other way indicators of compromise are collected is through research. You might be researching a new malware variant or a new attack and you will see that the indicators of compromise of this specific attack are shared among the uh, collaborators. So research and collaboration. Usually these are within what's called the threat intel feeds okay so where do we use them now up until now we have collected the indicators of compromise right now the question is how and where to use them completes the process or completes your understanding of threat intelligence now we collected the data now i want to analyze the data and use it so basically here we want what you want to do we want to standardize the collected data. So here now we have indicators of compromise collected. What we want to do, we want to use indicators of compromise to maybe um, create detection rules. Detection rules are rules created to detect current or future cyber attacks to create detection rules. How do we create detection rules? How do we use the IOC to, to create detection rules? Again, I said we need to standardize the collected IOCs. One of the methods of the popular tools to standardize the collection of IOCs is the use of Sigma rules. And I discussed and talked about Sigma rules separately in a separate video. You can get back to this video where we talk practical scenarios in using Sigma rules to generate rules based on the collected indicators of compromise. Now, Sigma rules uh, can then be used to transform uh, these rules into um, ready queries. These queries can be used in Splunk, can be used in Wazoo, can be used in Elasticsearch, and Basically, we use them in SIEM solutions. So in SIEM solutions, we execute queries to detect and analyze cyber attacks. And therefore now, we actually understand the link between threat intelligence and SOC monitoring. They are closely connected and they are overlapped uh, during your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, duties or during the conduction of your day-to-day -day duties in a security operation center. You are knowingly or unknowingly performing threat intelligence. Now to demonstrate all of these concepts in a practical scenario, I found nothing better than this room in TriHackMe, Threat Intelligence for SOC. It is a free room. The only thing you need to do is to create a free account in TriHackMe and then to you can then deploy the machine and start uh, going through the tasks. All right. So now let's go over these tasks. So we start with task two. In task two, we have a list of IP addresses. This is the list. What we're going to do, we need to use these, these IP addresses were collected somehow during an incident response or from a threat intelligence feeds. 
and they are known to belong to malicious actors. What we want to do here, we want to use these IP addresses and transform them into an actionable rules or actionable queries that can be used in one of the same solutions. So basically that's why there is a tool called the Uncoder. The Uncoder takes the IOCs that you have collected and then allows you to transform them into actionable rules that you can use them across different security products such as Elastic Stack, FireEye, QRadar, Qualys, Splunk, and definitely there is, uh, let's see if there is, uh, yeah, Greylog. So let's do that. So we're going to paste the IP addresses. And here from the list drop down, we can click on Elastic Stack and translate. So this generates a query that can be used in Elastic Stack. Now, this query can be ready to be used or you, you might need in some instances you might need to modify a little bit on the query because uh, it is actually this this query is generated by the encoder and depending on the product and the specific parameters in your environment you might need to adjust the variable names or some of the uh, other names or metadata in the query for now this query looks fine we're going to take this and we have here elastic stack now, if you're doing the room, make sure to adjust the date to start from 14 February and ends with 17 February. So by updating the query or by executing the query, make sure that you got 14 hits. So this query extracts or lists all the events where the destination IP addresses or the destination IP is one of these IP addresses. Typically here, we want to take a look at the events or the or the logs where the destination IP is one of these. So if you go back here to the question, see what there is to answer. How many unique IP addresses were provided in the integrator of compromises list? So our list is actually this. So we're going to take this and redo what we have just done. We're going to copy this and then execute the query. So how many unique IP addresses? As you can see, there are some duplicate IP addresses. To find the unique ones, it's very easy to look at the bottom here and you see the summary of the input data that you have pasted in the input box. As you can see, there are zero hashes, zero domains, zero URLs, obviously because we have just provided IP addresses, but we have 11 IPs. So encoders or encoder automatically the duplicates the input that you have or that you provide so we have 11 unique ip addresses based on the set of indicators of compromises how many ioc hits were discovered in the logs go back as you can see the hits were 48 meaning there are 48 events where the destination ip is one of these ip addresses out of the total number of iocs how many unique IP addresses were discovered in the logs? So now we're looking to find the unique IP addresses discovered in the logs. So we know, guys, that uh, these IPs contain duplicates or the list contain duplicates. So if you look at the destination IP address column, you see the top five values. Now, again, we know there are duplicates, so in order to extract the exact number of IP addresses found in the hits, we're going to click on Visualize. And here we, cho we choose the appropriate graph. Now, based on the data we have, bar, stat, or bar chart is one of the appropriate uh, graphs for this. You can also choose, uh, let's see here, line chart is not appropriate, so bar, horizontal or vertical is appropriate okay so how many unique IP addresses as you can see here we have around five because these are the top five values others what is the other other represents other IP addresses found in the events that are not among the top five values the top five values represent the IP addresses where uh, that receive the most traffic 
Okay. Now others represents other IP addresses that received less traffic than these uh, top five top five IP addresses. So now we know there are five IP addresses. If you click on other, we see we have two other IP addresses that had a share in the traffic. So two plus five equals seven. So seven IP ad unique IP addresses discovered in the logs. How many connections were made to this IP address? It is obviously the one ends with 215. So if you go back to the list, we see we have this, this IP address. What we can do, we can copy this, go back, And um, if you want to answer this question using Kibana queries, you will want to use the same query here, but change this to only one IP address. You can see we have 21 hits to this IP address. What is the IP address of the compromised host? Remember that these are destination IP addresses, meaning they were IP addresses that received traffic. So what was the sender or what was the origin source that sent the traffic to these IP addresses? This answers the question. So we're going to look at the source IP address and it is the IP address of the machine that was compromised. What is the destination port of connections made to IP that ends with 151 okay now let's go back a little bit here and in order to visualize the results of this query what we can do we can save the query say it is task 2 and then we can go to the visualization library create a visualization and here we can select um, let's see custom visualization map TSV lens drag and drop and now from here we can click on this drop down and select the saved queries there are no saved queries save oh, okay so it looks like the query was not saved properly Okay, that's fine. We're going to go back. Save current query. Task 2. It was already saved. I don't know why it didn't appear there. Save. save. Okay, now go to Visualize Library and then click on the one that we already created. Okay, we have task two now. Okay. It's 34 visualization. Now, what I want to visualize, we want to visualize the list of destination IP addresses. So we're gonna, from the list here, we're gonna drag destination IP to uh, horizontal, might be appropriate. Okay. And then we can select on the vertical axis, we can select the destination port. Okay, we want the IP address that ends with 151. Let's see here. 151, yeah, this one. 202, 175, this is the exact IP address we want. We're gonna click on this IP address to narrow down the, bar, uh, the, the uh, chart. So here we can see that the port is 80 all the time. So it is port 80. Intelligence driven prevention, that's task three. So what we just did here, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have been wondering what we did here, you see there is a list of indicators of compromise collected during a threat intelligence activity. So this list were used to generate an actionable query 
to be executed on one of these theme solutions. So this is how we actually use threat intelligence to actually analyze uh, a specific incident or a specific cyber attack. Now in task three. So in task three here, we have totally different scenario, but we're gonna stick with the same data set. We're gonna go back Click on discover. Yeah, totally fine. That's fine. Okay, we're back to discover here. So in the scenario here, we're given a domain name. Okay. Now this domain name has been seen in the wild belonging to an attacker or a malicious command and control. We want to check if the data that we have collected okay, from the network uh, contains this domain name as a destination domain name or as a domain that has been queried. Additionally, there was a DNS sinkhole that was created to prevent any DNS queries from passing through to this domain. The assumption here is that the IP address or the machine with this IP address was compromised. And as a result of this compromise, the machine was trying to contact the a command and control domain name or the domain names and the command and control to receive further you know uh, commands to be executed on the um, the machine so what we did here we want to find out if this domain name was one of these domain names that were contacted by our compromised machine and also we want to find out the other domain names based on the dns sinkhole we created so a DNS sinkhole is very much very well demonstrated here. So what happens when you have a compromise hole, such as the one here, the compromise hole will try to contact the command and control domain name, right? To do so, it's going to ask the DNS server for the IP address. By creating a DNS sinkhole, we prevent the resolution or the correct resolution of the malicious domain name into its correct IP address. Instead of uh, resoluting or resolving the uh, malicious domain into its correct IP address, using the DNS sinkhole, we resolve it into a not or the not correct resolution, like a DNS, uh, any DNS IP you want. It could be an internal IP, it could be a loopback IP, loopback IP address. The idea is to prevent the compromise hole from contacting the DNS server. So, let's see here. How many DNS queries to this domain name have been created? So, from the available fields or the filters, we gonna use DNS question dot name. DNS question dot name a field represents the domain name that was queried. So here we write DNS question name and as a value we're gonna use the the domain name that we suspect was queried. Of course we're gonna modify this and remove the remove the defan the defan form and transform it into a regular form. Update. So we have eleven hits. It means we have eleven. DNS queries sent to resolve this domain name. Before deploying the sinkhole configuration, what IPv4 addresses are resolved by this one? Okay, so we explain what is a DNS sinkhole. Okay, now before a DNS sinkhole is deployed, this malicious domain name should resolve into its correct IP addresses. So now we know we have 11 hits to this domain name. If we, get, if we look at the IP addresses, destination IP addresses, DNS resolved IP. This filter or this field represents or contains the values of the IP resolved IP addresses. You can see there is one internal IP address occupying most of the uh, queries here, right? This is not the IP address we want because this is an internal IP and it cannot uh, represent 
a domain name. The domain name should resolve into a public IP address. So most probably this IP address is the resolution of this domain name after the DNS sync call was configured. Now, other than this IP address, we have two IP addresses, which are the IP addresses of this domain name. What is the IP address used for DNS sync call? Now, since now we know what are the correct IP addresses to which the domain name resolve, we now know that this IP address is the IP address used for the DNS sync call. Typically, now when the compromised host tries to contact this IP address, what happens thanks to our DNS sync call, it's going to resolve to this internal domain name and therefore the compromise host will not be able to contact the malicious C2 server. How many hits were caused by connections to sync hold domains? DNS resolve and that's the IP address of the sync call. So we have around 115 hits. This represents the hits to the sync call. How many hits were caused by connections to sync call domains 115? Now, what are the domains that have been sync called? Let's find out these domain names uh, that the host tried to contact, right? So to, to find these domain names, we're going to need to use and here. And DNS question name. And I'm going to use a wildcard. I'm going. I want here to match all the domain names, okay? That were that were queried, and where the resolved IP address was the IP address of the sync call. Therefore, I effectively extract all the domain names uh, that were contacted and redirected to the sync call. Going to update, and this will result in the same number of fits. That's great. Let's now save this query. and name it task 3 okay we go to now visualize and we create another visualization with lens drag and drop and from here i select the query task 3 okay Domain names now. Let's see here what kind of um, chart here is appropriate. I think table is appropriate because I want to see the domain names with the IP addresses and the count. So on the rows and columns and metrics. On the rows we have the D, uh, the DNS destination port. Let's look for the DNS question name, the domain name we want to see okay and this is the domain DNS question let's also have the resolution make sure that the IP address is correct and then we want to see the count right we want to find out the count how many unique domain is all right the count now from the metrics we click on Add drag and drop and select count. Let's have a look here. So now we have, as you can see, the domain names, their IP addresses, and the count of record. Now, let's expand the list of IP addresses by clicking on the top values of DNS question name and select the number of values from 5 and increase it up to 100. So now we have the list of the domain names with their IP addresses or the resolved IP address and the count of hits of records. The question here is how many unique domain names? Let's count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We have 12 IP addresses. Okay, task 4. Okay, after logging in, ls. We have one directory, elastalert. In this task, we're going to use elastalert. 
In last alert, as the name suggests, it is a tool that can be integrated with Elasticsearch to generate alerts that can be sent to your email. Okay. It is very much similar to the alerting functionality in Splunk, and it is the core of any SOC center. You want alerts to be sent to your email or to your phone or to your other colleagues when there is uh, a match against one of the created rules. So if you want to do that with Elasticsearch, you want to use Elasticalert. So if you see it to Elasticalert, we have two directories. The main configuration directory, which houses all the configurations that connect Elasticalert to the instance of the running or the running instance of Elasticsearch. And we have the rules. This is where we create the rules that upon match, that upon being matched will Elastic, cert, Elastic Alert will send the notifications. Let's take a look at the rules. So we have one rule created. Let's take a look at this one. It is the sync call rule. So based on the written rule, it is debug. The alert type is debug, mean it is meaning it's informational rule. Description is placeholder rule, meaning we want to we're gonna change on this rule, and it is for the uh, contacted domain names through Zeek RDS. We're going to change on this rule so that it matches Elasticsearch. We're given a sigma rule here in this task. We need to transform the sigma rule right from here. We transform the sigma rule into an Elast alert. Okay, let's take a look here. So the alert type is debug, description sigma rule for sync called DNS queries. And this is the author, the filter, the DNS resolved. Here the assumption is that when you create a DNS sync call, the IP address that you choose for the DNS resolution is the loopback IP address. That's the assumption. If this doesn't match your case, change the IP address here to the one you used in your DNS sync call. Okay. Okay, the index here is going to change to reflect the actual index we have. The index here is file bit. Let's see. If we go back to the main view, discover. So, file bit. Yes, we're going to copy this directly from the room to prevent any typos. I'm very well known. In making typos that's why I'm gonna have to paste this here okay I'm gonna copy this and go back to the rule we have so I'm gonna remove all this And that's our new rule now. Okay, now once the new rule has been configured and written into a last alert, now it's time to see if there are matches in the data we have in Elasticsearch. So just execute a last alert with this start date, and then the output will be sent to, or the output, yeah, it will be sent to this file. Okay, so how do we know that it is finished? When you see this line, uh, let's scroll up. So zero query hits, zero matches, zero alerts. I'm gonna hit Control C now and take a look at the output. This line, we have zero query hits, but 40 matches, 40 alert sent. What does that? What does that mean? It means that there were 40 hits to the DNS sinkhole domain name. Let's see the questions. What is the value of the alert field in the converted elast rule? You can take a look here and the value is debug. How many alerts were generated by the rule? We already answered this, 40. And now how many unique domains were sinkholed via this IP address? This can be answered by going to the elastic stack 
and here we can modify this and change it into four zeros let's see how many unique domains were sync called via this IP address looks like it shouldn't be this resolved but I'm going to try with this Let me remove this one. And here we're going to have to find a different field this time. DNS answers data. So this field represents the query or the answer to the query sent by the host. So DNS answers. and it should be four zeros so there are 40 hits okay we want to find now how many unique domains were seen called you can already you can also answer this question by using a different field which is dns resolved ip address this one Okay, now to find the domain names, we're going to have to say and and here DNS question name use a wildcard update and we're going to name save this query task for And now go to visualize. From here we create a new visualization. And we select task four. Now you want to see the sync hold domains. Again, I'm gonna use table. I prefer table over other type of visualizations. So here scrolling down, selecting DNS answers data and we select question name we want to see the queries and the resolution as well and you can select count in the metrics so we have four unique domain names let's make sure that no other domains were found click on DNS answers data and make sure they are we already have only four so let's try ten but we have others here we want to find out the value of others other domain names okay one two three four five six seven looks like when the more we expand on the on this column the more values we get let's put hundred here and here we put 100 okay now you have only 10 domain names one two three four or oh, three we have seven domain names seven domain names were resolved to this ip address meaning these are the sync hold domain names what is the sync hold domain that has an ru tld you can answer this from here it is twist ru so that is it i hope you guys found this helpful and remember that this video was part of the soak level 2 thank you for watching